Okay, welcome to online mini lecture 10 for atmospheric chemistry and physics. Charlie Stanier here. Uh, I'm skipping the review because we're totally changing topics. We're switching from atmospheric chemistry to particles, aerosol particles. Uh, and so the reading that goes with this is chapter 8 in Seinfeld and Pandas. And in this lecture, I'm going to talk about the, uh, an introduction to particles, size distribution functions, and I'll be pulling in some coronavirus examples uh, as I go. Uh, for the coronavirus information uh, incorporated slides from Lindsay Mart, Virginia Tech, uh, so that's how you spell her name. Uh, she's been very active in the coronavirus response, um, applying what she knows about infectious aerosols uh, to the problem. And I encourage you to follow her on Twitter. Um, so this says uh, Lindsay Marr, uh, Civil Environmental Engineering, Virginia Tech, 26 March, 2020. Okay, so particles. What's the smallest particle? This, this is when I have a nice conversation with the class about what the smallest particle is. But we have to answer here just straight out. Uh, one nanometer to three nanometers. Depends on chemistry. Uh, whether it's a stable particle or not. So we're talking about 10 angstroms to 30 angstroms, if you think in angstroms. And, you know, if I get smaller than this, I'm definitely a gas. And then we get into a regime of clusters of molecules that are uh, of a variety of stability. Some of those uh, clusters are just, they come together, they're short-lived, they fall back apart to gas molecules. Sometimes the clusters grow or they're stable, right? And so it's proper to, deter to, to call them particles. Uh, but they're so small at this uh, level that you can't, there's no clear boundary between the gas molecules and then there's the particle, where the particle has the properties of the bulk solid material. Um, that doesn't really apply at these small sizes. But we get clusters, and then we get nanoparticles. Right? But even at the nanoparticle level, the uh, properties can be very different from the bulk solid or liquid, you can have liquid nanoparticles uh, or liquid-like nanoparticles uh, properties. The total size range for particles is, let's say, one nanometer for a small size up to about 100 microns, so a tenth of a millimeter. Uh, and this upper limit is just determined by the settling velocity. So gravitational, you know, a baseball is a particle but it's not really atmospherically relevant because it's going to fall at a fast rate and fall out of the atmosphere. So uh, the largest really atmospherically relevant particle might be 100 microns. It just depends on the, the application. Uh, certainly there's windblown dust and uh, sea salt that's bigger than 100 microns. It's just it's very local in its nature. It gets generated a, at a point in space, and then usually it falls to the ground uh, very close to that location. Uh, in terms of terminology, uh, in the air pollution field, 
they refer to, uh, they'll use aerosol and particle interchangeably. In other fields of science, they're a little more picky, uh, where an aerosol is a suspension of particles. in a carrier gas. And by saying the aerosol, we're talking about the whole thing, the particles and the carrier gas and all their properties. Uh, some other terminology issues, we have primary versus secondary. So these entered the atmosphere as a liquid or solid particle. These enter uh, through uh, chemical reaction and gas to particle, uh, particle processes. This can get a little fuzzy, right? Because uh, let's say I have a, a smokestack, right? And I've got uh, hot lead vapor, right? PB as a gas in the stack, right? And then as it cools, it might form particles here. Right, so is this lead primary or secondary? Well, by the definition I gave, it entered the atmosphere through a gas to particle process, if you're saying that the atmosphere started right at the exit of the stack. And maybe this is 10 meters, 20 meters, however long it takes to cool to some sort of nucleation and solidification temperature. Most people would call this a primary emission, right? Just because uh, most people aren't interested in the details of the, these 10 or 20 meters. They're interested in, like, the people that live over here and the uh, ecosystem, you know, 100 miles downwind. And for those applications, it's a primary solid emission. Uh, it's only for the uh, specialized application where you're thinking about what's happening in the plume where this could be considered a gas-to-particle process. The residence time of particles in the atmosphere is a strong function of size. Uh, if we're talking about particle diameters, dp, less than 10 microns, so small-ish particles, then the time scale is days to weeks. And the chemical composition of particles in the atmosphere is varied, but uh, it often gets discussed or grouped in terms of sulfate, ammonium, nitrates, sodium, chloride, trace metals, crustal elements, so elements that are in high concentrations in soil and rock, so that's calcium, aluminum, iron, uh, potassium, and then carbonaceous material, and that will 
fall into a continuum of more organic to uh, more soot like carbon and then water is contained in atmospheric particles. So we need to be able to describe a population of particles. So what are the steps to describing a population of particles? And I've got, you know, a population of particles here. It's a pile of sand. Right, how would we describe this, this population? Well, we would need to first decide on a definition. This is one way. I mean, one way would be get every grain and uh, exhaustively describe it, right, shape, chemical composition as a function of position within the uh, grain of sand, maybe optical properties of each grain of sand, right, but there's, you know, more information than you would want to carry around for most applications. So a, a more feasible way would be decide on a definition of diameter for each grain, and here are a few choices. You can use the volume equivalent sphere, so this is, you know, what's the diameter of, an, of a car? Well, one way to do this would be to say what's the diameter of a sphere that would have the same volume as the car. Um, the Stokes diameter, which is an aerodynamic diameter. Um, there is another aerodynamic diameter called aerodynamic diameter. And another one called the vacuum aerodynamic diameter. And there's one that's common because it's measured a lot, is the electrical mobility equivalent diameter. And there's many more. But once you've made a choice, you could determine uh, the either the diameter of every particle or the distribution of diameters. Here's a, uh, an electron micrograph. Sorry, uh, let's upside down. Look that. Okay, so here's a bunch of particles, and these ones are not spheres, right? You can see all kinds of shapes. Uh, so the choice of diameter would matter a lot. A natural one here would be the equivalent. Uh, circular diameter, right? The the uh, what diameter would have the same area as the uh, projected area that we could see on the electron micrograph? So um, I think this whole distance is five microns. It's a little um, unclear, but you can see we've got uh, very linearly, you know, almost round particles, and then uh, much more uh, linear particles. So uh, the second choice, right, is whether we're going to use uh, individual or uh, distribution. Uh, statistics. Uh, 
So option A, uh, single particle characteristics. So you make a list, particle one, particle two, particle three, and then whatever characteristics you're gonna, that are important to your problem or that you can measure, like size, shape, uh, chemistry, Uh, maybe you can get a microscope image of it. There's software that can go through an image of a whole bunch of particles and pick out each one. And so you get that for particle one, particle two, particle three, and so on. And so by doing this for all the particles, we've described the population. Uh, option B, at least for size, we can do a size distribution. Where we have a function that describes the probability of uh, finding, you know, a particle between size dp and dp uh, prime, let's say. So we can say, uh, we can come up with a number of different functions that would say, let's say this was 10 nanometers and 11 nanometers. What's the probability that we find some particles somewhere between 10 and 11 nanometers? So this was page 26. Twenty-seven. So if you're going to use a size distribution, you have some choices to make. We'll call it choice one. Are you going to use for your x-axis? Are you going to use the log 10 of your size, the natural logarithm of your size, or a linear scale for your uh, x-axis in graphing? You're going to use regular or irregular uh, bin spacings. If you if you have discrete size bins, you don't have to. You could just have a function. And then the third choice is whether you normalize the particle count. To the bin width, and I know this; these choices don't resonate with you just yet, but I'll, I'll get us all there. Okay. So if yes, then you take the number of particles in a bin, delta n, and divide by the bin width, delta the change in diameter across the bin, or uh, if you're using logarithm, you might do delta n over delta ln dp, and so on. So the best practices. So the information is carried, um, pretty much whatever choices you made, but some of the choices are more convenient for communicating the information. Um, so normalize. Yes, you should normalize and this makes uh, inner comparison. Uh, easier across studies. Uh, and that you should use the x-axis uh, that matches your bin 
normalization. So if you're going to uh, just have, if you're going to normalize your distribution to bin width, then you just use a linear axis. If you're going to normalize to the change in the natural logarithm, then you should use the natural logarithm for the axis. And if you're going to use the change in the log 10 diameter, then you should use log 10 uh, of diameter as your x-axis. And there are often features in the distribution at small sizes, and you can see them if you use a log scale. And then the uh, last best practice here is uh, the bin spacing is not too important. Once you normalize, uh, inner comparison is inter comparison between distributions is easiest uh, and most accurate. with consistent bins. But it's possible uh, other, with, without consistent bins even. All right, so I think we need an example. This is um, this is an example of why we need a distribution to describe uh, particles. This, in this case, liquid droplets. So droplets in a human sneeze. Uh, one thing is it can travel a long way. That's about 25 feet. Uh, and this here's the citation to this. Uh, and you can see some very large. Uh, spit, if you will, from the human sneeze uh, that's falling very quickly. And then you can see the smaller particles are uh, going much longer distances. If you're interested in these fall velocities, those are in our textbook. Um, I believe they're in chapter 9 of the textbook. Uh, here are center, uh, centimeter per hour fall velocities. So those big droplets um, were probably, you know, a full millimeter, or let's say they were a, hun a tenth of a millimeter. So they're falling at uh, was 100,000 centimeters per hour. So that's uh, 100 meters per hour. So fast fall um, velocities. But as we get to, uh, as we'll see, the uh, naked coronavirus, 120 nanometers, so its fall velocity is between 0.1 and 1 centimeter per hour. So that's like, you know, small, much smaller than my hand per hour, which is why in an unventilated room, these particles, uh, 
don't deposit to surfaces very quickly. Or even outdoors, uh, there'll be uh, some particles around if there is uh, any particle emission because they can survive in, uh, they don't fall out of the air. Survival is a different thing because viruses aren't alive. Um, whether they can uh, lead to infection, whether they're infectious or viable uh, for replication in the body is another matter. So a few comments about settling velocity. Uh, you can calculate this theoretically by equating the gravitational force that's pulling down and the uh, drag force that's opposing it. And you can calculate the drag force by the Stokes law uh, between 5 and 60 microns, and you'll find this in engineering textbooks. Less than 5 microns, you need a correction uh, due to the fact that the, the mean free path of air molecules, so the average distance that air molecules travel between collision and the particle size start to approach each other, it's called a, a slip correction factor. If you go above 60 microns, uh, then the uh, turbulent fluid mechanics gets a little interesting and you get uh, separation of the wake uh, and you need experimental drag coefficients that depend on the size of, uh, I'm sorry, the shape of the particles. So anyway. And I've been talking about uh, example sizes. Uh, so We'll get back to the size distributions, but here are some uh, sizes of stuff, right? And they're not all to scale. These are meant to be to scale. So we've got 90 micron beach sand, and then the human hair at 50 micron, and then we have in blue 10 micron particles. Uh, like dust, pollen, mold, and then in red, these little, um, what we call particulate matter at 2.5 microns in size. Uh, and so this would be 2,500 nanometers in diameter, each of those little red balls, and those are um, like our pollution particles. And the naked SARS virus is 0.12 microns, so it would just be like a dot um, from my pen there because uh, that's two and a half microns is 0.12 micron. Uh, influence uh, a little smaller uh, and at 30 nanometers or 0.03 microns is the rhinovirus. So this gives a, a, some typical sizes that we need to be uh, thinking about for um, pollution applications and for um, infectious aerosol considerations. One more uh, Lindsay Marr, I just, not aerosol science, but what's inside that? Uh, RNA, RNA is inside that. Um, so once it can get uh, inside tissue, then it can replicate uh, using the RNA. All right, back to size distributions. So we'll set up this example, uh, and then we'll, uh, I'll probably take a break uh, and come back to it, because I was trying to keep these um, relatively short, and I know I've gone a little long. OK, so let's say we've got some measurements of particles in air. And we've got them in these different bins. We've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 bins. Right? And for each bin, we, ha we have a concentration, the number of particles per cubic centimeter of air. So this bin is 1 nanometer to 10 nanometers. And it said, let's imagine we have 100 particles per cubic centimeter in that size range. Next size range, 10 nanometers to 20 nanometers, 200 in that size range, and so on, all the way up to 5 microns to 10 microns. 
one particle per cubic centimeter in that size range. Uh, the naked coronavirus would be in, at, uh, in, in this bin right here, 80 to 160 nanometers. And the you know, fresh sneeze droplets would be this and, and above. So there's the concentration. This is the cumulative concentration. And these are the normalized concentrations uh, where they have taken the concentration and divided by the bin width. And so we want to look at some different um, options for visualizing this size distribution uh, information. And that's where we'll stop and come back.